My name is Stanley Towers Lane. I was named Tow Towers after my grandfather, and that's my father, my mother's father. Mm -hmm. And um, my father was uh, a Lane from the uh, Lane County, which is uh, between uh, Comfort and Center Point. There is um, my great grandfather had thirty-four thousand acres there, and. Uh, he, um, there's still a building standing today uh, where my father went to school. That, that school was used up to 1962, and then they closed it. Now it's used for, uh, just for lecture, lecture, elections. They would set up um, posters for the people who are running for different offices within the county, and people go there to vote in that precinct there. I see. Mm -hmm. So your family has a long history in Texas. Long history. Mm -hmm. My, uh, gr my great grandfather Lane um, came to Texas in about 1827, and he um, received the rights to own land. In order to do this, um, he had to become a Catholic, and his father was a Baptist minister back in Tennessee. His father was the first minister of any denomination in Tennessee. Has quite a history back there, but. Um, when he came to Texas, he, uh, he uh, came with a group of men, they were just for adventure. And um, his wife had died, which would be my great-grandmother, and um, he just came to Tennessee and, I mean, he came to Texas and uh, several of them, and he decided he liked it and he thought he would come back. So he um, went back to Tennessee and he uh, met a woman that was also a widow, her husband who was a friend of his, had died, and they got married. And, um, oh, a couple of years passed by, and uh, she decided she did not want to come to Texas. And they had um, kind of pooled their resources together. So I have a will that he made out, um, giving her so many horses and so many cows and so many uh, instruments to plow fields with, and, and they shared uh, some of the slaves that he had. And he came to Texas with uh, two of his sons. Uh, my grandfather was one of his sons also. His name was Sam, and his father was named Sam. But he had two brothers. And uh, he came two years later to what would be Center Point, Texas. And um, that's where they established their home. It's the, Gu the Guadalupe River goes right through the middle of it. Okay. Uh, they had land on both sides and some of the main things that they would do, they would cut down these big tall cypress trees and make, and make homes out of it. They would cut the plane, the wood into planks and, and from there they would sell the wood and, uh, and, uh, to people who were building their homes around there. It's interesting because you know, they're, they have big families. My grandfather had a lot of, uh, nine children. And only um, three of the boys and two of the girls came to Texas. The rest of them stayed back in Tennessee. But each, each one of the family groups, as you go back, uh, there's always been a Sam Lane and every generation back through that time. Okay. So uh, they settled in Lane, what is now Lane County. Lane, Lane Valley. Lane Valley. And uh, if you'd go there today... Um, had 34,000 acres, as I said, and you go there today, you drive going about five miles, and there's a big field, and um, I'm really getting ahead of myself. I'm going to say this. My grandfather was, great-grandfather was killed by the Indians, and um, there was four days before they found him. When they found him, his body had already started decaying, so they buried him on site, and he was... Um, part of the commissioner's court in Kerrville at that time. And that was the party that had dismissed their court proceedings to look for the body, look for him. They knew he'd probably be dead. Anyhow, when I went to Lane Valley and um, I was looking for my grand, grand, great-grandfather's grave, I ran across a man who had some, bought some of the Lane property. And um, 
He said, well, I have something that might be of interest to you. You see, there was a big field, 60-acre field, and in this 60-acre field there was a knoll, just a little knoll, just like a, oh, maybe 50 feet high, and just kind of round and just came out of the field, and their field was all around this. He says, go up to that field. I was driving in my car, and, and he, uh, he was out with a, um, a sickle, and he was cutting uh, uh, weeds and different types of things. He was trying to clear his field out with him. I thought he's really going to have a hard job with this. Anyhow, he, he opened the gate, and I drove up the little knoll where this was, and there was about uh, 20 graves there, and some of them was named Lane. It would be like a, a Frank Lane or a, a Jim Lane or a, a George Lane. And there would be uh, uh, Isidore Lanes and Francis Lane and all these different names. And so when, when he came, he says, well, now, these must be all your kin folks. And I said, you know, I don't recognize any of these names. Uh, they, don't, they don't appear to me at all. I just had never heard of them before, and he laughed. He says, these were your great-grandfather's slaves. And um, some of the names uh, were, like I said, Lane, and then there's some of them was the name Blank, B-L-A-N-K. And that would be like uh, Jesse Blank or Isidore Blank. And um, he says, you know why those names are Blank? I said, no, I don't understand this. And he says, well, let me tell you. He says, uh, when the Civil War came along, and um, the South lost, and the slaves had been emancipated, the owners had to give them so much of their land. And they had big, broad fields and where the Guadalupe River went right through it. And um, they had their choice. And they didn't choose any of the Dobie Hills. They chose the fertile lands where the fields had been cleared out of the big trees. And this made my grandfather mad. So he told them he, they could not use the name Lane anymore after this. This was uh, recorded uh, in Centerpoint. It was in the paper. There was a whole page article about this, how my grandfather had changed the name of the Lanes because of the uh, slaves whose name were Lane because of the fact that uh, they, the South had lost the war and the, the slaves had been emancipated. They no longer had masters. But I was really didn't want to go talk to you about this, but if you have any questions you want to ask me, I'd be glad to help you. You really had wanted to talk to us about your uncles, well, I was going great to, uncles? Yeah, but well, it didn't make any difference. They were, uh, my, these are my two great uncles. They were captured by the Indians. This is a book by them. I have a bigger book. When I was a little boy, I lived in Bandera. Let me say this. When the in the late 1800s, the Guadalupe River got on a big rise, and it washed all the homes away that's along the river. And so my grandfather's house was washed away. The water came into the inside the house and just washed everything away, except the school. The school that my great-grandfather had built, where my father went to school, was on a knoll, a little hill, and it's up from the river maybe... Um, 200 feet, 300 feet up above the river, and it's a high place there. Anyhow, um, the school stayed there, but the house was washed away, so my grandfather then said okay to my father and his brothers and sisters that they were going to move to the back of Lane Valley. And we moved to the back of Lane Valley and put us five miles from Bandera on Privilege Creek. And he built a home there, and that's where I was born and raised. It's a, a two-story house. And it, um, I loved it. It uh, stood for a long time, still standing well not today because it, it caught on fire. But it had a big fireplace in it. That was the only heat in the house. And my mother and father gave me a cot, uh, a metal cot, like an old army cot, that I would stay in the living room where the fireplace was so I'd be warmed in the wintertime. It really was cold, lots colder those days than it seems to be during this day and time. But that's on Privilege Creek. It, um, that house burned down, but it was built in this place again. And that's the house that my father sold in uh, 1954. He had 1,800 acres when they divide the property up. And um, he gave me the money to buy this piece of this ranch I have here in Blanco now. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm located in Blanco. But I was going to talk to you about 
met my grandfather's wife. Her name was Amanda Smith. Her father came from Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, they're primarily German. And Smith is an English name. His name was really Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. And when he was going to come to South Texas, or to Texas, he knew that uh, in Europe, there was uh, the Germany had conquered Poland, uh, France, uh, most of the European nations, the, conquer the Germans had conquered, and uh, everybody hated Germans. So he changed his name from Schmidt to Smith, S-M-I-T-H. He came to Texas in 1827. He helped erect the first building um, in Austin. There was no buildings there, and he helped erect the first one. And he and his wife, he married a girl who, whose name was um, uh, Fanny Short, S-H-O-R-T. And uh, she became Lane. They had um, my father, and he had nine brothers and sisters. Her father, who had changed his name from Schmidt to Smith, was a uh, went to work in San Antonio, and he owned a um, a gun shop. He was uh, worked on different guns, and he would sell guns to people. This would be in the, probably the 1830s. And um, he, from there, he was um, became a Texas Ranger, and uh, just like the, the Lane saw, all the Lane men became Texas Rangers, and um, they fought uh, the independent outlaws and people who would come to Texas who were uh, disobedient to the laws. Anyhow, this uh, this Smith. My grandfather Smith, he had nine children, and he had two little boys. I had more than that, but two boys. One was five years old, the other was seven. They were out tending their father's sheep. They were on the Ciblo Creek. You have any idea where that's at? As you drive to between here and San Antonio, you pass a just before you get to San Antonio, you pass a, a creek bed, and it says Ciblo. Well, that day the, that Ciblo Creek used to run all the time. And he had a ranch on the Sybil Creek. And he had sheep out there, and he had um, got these two boys to tend the sheep. There were about 200 head of sheep. And they would go with him, and they would bring him home at night because of the coyotes and the wolves. And, and there, we had a lot more different animals that, during that day and time, and they would bring the sheep into big pens. And uh, well, they were out one day with their father's sheep. They saw Indians coming. And so they hid in brush, and the uh, Indians formed a circle around them, and um, they hollered at them, and, and they they knew that the two boys were there, and they uh, challenged them to come out, and they kept taunting them. Well, they pulled out a gun like they were going to kill the two boys, and then the boys decided, well, we better go in. And so they were, like I said, one of the oldest boy was seven, the youngest boy was five. And um, when they grabbed hold of the youngest boy, the oldest boy then, whose name was Clinton, he ran underneath the belly of the horse and tried to get away. Well, they, they circled him again, and this time they pointed a gun at him, and he knew that if he didn't go to them, that they would shoot him. So he went to this one man who seemed to be the chief, and he put out his hand and, and, and put his foot out where he could step on the foot, and he could get in the back of the saddle. And so they, um, they rode off. Uh, the, uh, the sheep that evening came home on their own because they were used to it. When the two boys were not there, they realized that something had gone wrong. And uh, the band of Indians, there were, about, there were about 20 of them. And they were Ki Kiowas. They, um, that's a, that's a, a type of tribe that was in Texas at that time. And they did a lot of trading amongst the other Indians. And so they started heading up towards Oklahoma. And... Um, the Texas Rangers tried to head them off, and they they would build uh, uh, reserves of men across a certain area, but the Indians would go around them or sneak through at night, and they never could catch them. 
they um, they killed a man's cow as they were going along because they had no water, and the um, the boys first at would not eat, and so finally they realized that they didn't eat, that they would have nothing to eat. So they gave them a piece of liver, and uh, even though this is raw, they, they chewed on it pretty, pretty much so because they were really hungry. They uh, went on and uh, passed Fort Worth and went up in Oklahoma, and there they were traded uh, to other Indians of that tribe. There were Apaches, and there were Comanches, and there was one man who was... Um, the chief of his tribe, and his name was Geronimo. Geronimo was has a history of his own, and the youngest boy was sold to him. Sold to him. They um, took irons, hot irons, and they branded the youngest boy on the cheek. Uh, this is the picture of the two two boys when they were young men, and this book is about their lives. But there's pictures in here of them that um, it shows. The brand, if I can find it. Well, it may not be in this book. It may be in the older. This is the two oldest boys right here. Two, two boys, and they were old men by that time. They were they were both Texas Rangers in their latter days of their lives. Anyhow, they uh, the youngest boy was branded, and uh, Geronimo uh, was kind to it. He was, he was assigned to one of the Geronimo's wives. He had several wives. And that's same true of, um, of Clinton. Clinton uh, was the oldest boy and, and Jeff was the youngest boy. They lived with the Indians. Uh, Clinton lived five years with them and Jeff lived seven years with them. And they went on different raids with the Indians and as, as they spent more and more time with them, they began to feel that they were part of that tribe. They would ride horses and they would have camp meets together and they, they had all types of ceremonies where they would uh, pull tricks on the white boys. There were other boy, white boys and girls that were captured by other Indians. and uh, But they would get to have meetings together. They'd have foot races and they'd shoot arrows and uh, chase things. and. They made them ride horses, wild horses. They would tie their legs underneath the belly of the horse so they couldn't get thrown off. But the horse would pitch and they would just really shook them up. They, they learned how to ride horses good that well. Anyhow, they, uh, one of the questions that I used to ask them when I was a boy, did you ever shoot anybody? And they would kind of hang their heads because they had become just like the Indians themselves. They had lost the relationship with the real mother and real father. And really, they, they had uh, almost forgot how to speak English. They, uh, they knew Apache and Comanche, but they could not really speak English well. So this book uh, draws a, a lot about them. That's a picture of Geronimo right there you're just looking at. Mm -hmm. This is Geronimo. If you remember him, have you ever read about Geronimo? He was, uh, he was a famous... Indian chief that caused lots of trouble amongst Texas. He would raid and kill and uh, steal horses, steal cattle, and uh, did a lot of terrible things. But for young boys who were of the impressionable age, they begin to think that's the way life was, and they begin to feel just like they did. They they enjoyed. Uh, that kind of line. It tells about how, uh, the book tells about how that they were, um, uh, would compete with tribe, different tribes, uh, horseback riding and shooting arrows and shooting guns and um, swimming, learn how to swim, do all things of nature. And they, as they with the tribe longer, then they would take horses and would um, watch them at night. And, and um, sometimes they would hobble the horse so they would not run. If he had a, if they, some horses would try to run away, then they would hobble them so they could not run away. So their job is to watch the, the, the horses at night and um, fetch wood for the, with the squaws and um, do menial tasks. 
But as they grew older with the Indians, they began to fight with them. And when they went on raids, they would go on raids with them. They, um, the oldest boy, who was part of a Comanche tribe, the, the American soldiers began to press them real hard. And so they sold them to some Mexicheros. These were Mexicans who would come up into the Indian country and they would trade ammunition and trade uh, different things to the Indians for uh, skins from buffalo or skin from bear or skins with the, that they would have use of. And um, so as things pressed on, as the, as the tribes were being pressed by the American soldiers, they sold Clint to the Mexicans and the Mexicans then took Clint back to Texas and uh, his father had to pay money for them. Um, he ran away from home several times, but they would, he would always, they would always catch him and get him, bring him back. He really enjoyed the Indian life, and um, he could not associate at first with his father or his mother, even though they, um, you know, he knew they loved them. And there was something about them that he that he realized that he he was old enough that he remembered that they were good to him and and things like this but still there was a, a streak within him that uh, wanted to make him get back to the Indians. The youngest boy was two more years with uh, Geronimo, he was with Geronimo seven years and um, finally um, some of the tribes, some of the Indians, male Indians of the tribe took uh, Jeff um, to some of the Camacheros, that's what they call the, the Mexicans who would trade with the Indians, and they sold him for so much ammunition. They, they were being pressed um, at that time for, uh, for food and for ammunition. And so they sold him, they brought him back, and um, Jeff, the oldest brother, remembers when they brought uh, this boy, this who was captured and he was tied on his horse when they brought him to his father, um, he recognized him, even though he would hide from him and, and um, didn't want to be seen by him, yet the little boy kept looking for him. The little boy by that time, um, he was probably uh, 13 or 14 years old, maybe a little older than that. Anyhow, they, they untied him and they, uh, the two boys together celebrated knowing each other and seeing each other again after so many years. They, um, they left home. They uh, went with a man who was, uh, whose name was Chisholm, and he, they took herds of cattle up to Kansas, and it was called the Chisholm Trail, the Chisholm Trail Drivers. And they would do this uh, for maybe uh, $20 a, a month, something like this which would not be very much money, but to them it was a lot of money. And this is how they, they gradually grew back into the understanding that they were white and that the Indians were a different tribes and uh, the, um, they understood that their part should be, their place should be with their families. Anyhow, when I was a little boy, I was raised in Bandera, on my grandfather's ranch, and uh, these two boys would come to visit my grandmother who lived with us. And they would play tricks on me. They said that if I, um, I ran around the house three times real fast, that there would be um, something following me. And I thought, oh, that, I can't believe this. So I tried it. I'd run around the house real fast three times, and they would pull up my britches leg and look at the calf of my leg, and they said, "See, you have two little calves following you. That's what the calf of your leg is called, calf." You know? So I thought that was funny. They're, they took great delight in, in playing tricks on me as a boy, all kind of tricks. But I, um, I held them in high esteem. I knew that they had been captured by the Indians, and I knew that their, their lives had been different. And um, my grandmother, my, my grandfather had already died, and my grandmother had a big trunk, and I, and I stayed upstairs, that was my room was upstairs, had a big trunk in it, and I was really not to touch that trunk. And uh, when she died, my mother took that trunk out and, and 
she opened it up and there was three Indian scalps in there. And um, this is, my grandfather had done this. They, uh, they felt that the Indians saw that um, they had scalped the other Indians and they would um, not slaughter them. But they would shoot them maybe, but not, not cut off an arm and leg or things like this, what they would do. And they would they, they would honor him and not not put him to a torturous death. They would just kill him. So he had pistols in there and he had um, these three scalps in there. And my mother saw these things and she took them out and she burned them. And I, I, I was really envious of those guns. I thought, golly, I'd really like to have those. But I couldn't say anything. That was not my say. But anyhow, these two boys, they... Um, they became ranchers, had their own ranches. The oldest boy had a ranch, uh, it was uh, south, it was, it was actually west of San Antonio, maybe uh, 120 miles. The youngest boy lived in the city and they um, became good citizens. Geronimo was finally captured and uh, when he was captured, they brought him to San Antonio. They kept him at the Quandragle at Fort Sam Houston, and um, they both went to see him. And when they went to see him, he threw their, his arms around them and they cried, but all three of them were crying. And because um, they had lost something. Uh, Geronimo knew that he was probably gonna be put to death. And the two boys wept over him because they were, he was like a father to them. Their father, in, um, uh, let's see, after Texas became an independent uh, statehood, their father uh, was a, um, a federal marshal. One well, of the first federal marshals of San Antonio. There's a picture of him right here. And in San Antonio, at the museum, there's a big picture of him, this man here, because as a federal marshal, everybody wore guns. Everybody wore guns. And all fights ended up in a gunfight. He was a federal marshal for two years in San Antonio and killed 22 men. And he, when you would think about this, you think, well, this, this man was terrible. But actually, that's how many times he laid his life on the line. And he was lucky that he didn't kill. He, he had got wounded several times, but he killed those many men. The Texas uh, Historical Society in San Antonio, which is right next to the Witt Museum, if you've ever been to San Antonio. There's a life history about him, and as he was um, the federal marshal. The federal marshal at that time was appointed by the state uh, out of Austin. It was not um, appointed by the city itself. It was appointed by state officials. And so he served that capacity for two years. Um, then he moved to... Uh, moved to his ranch on the Sybil River, and um, he was, um, his wife, my grandmother, had died, Fanny Short, and um, he met another woman who had a little son, and this woman uh, did not really, she was a city girl, and she was not used to the country life. It's a hard life. It was a hard life. They had no, had no running water in the house, no heat in the house. If you had anything like that, you had to, had to have a fireplace, or you had to have an iron stove that you could cook wood in, or burn wood in. And um, he, he got sick, and he died. He's buried now on where Camp Stanley is. Are you familiar with that, where Camp Stanley is? As you go to San Antonio, you go through, um, if you went by uh, Bernie, uh, you would go by um, Camp Stanley first. Then um, there's another big camp there, bigger than Stanley. Oh, I can't think of it right now, but it's a big military camp. It's on the north side of San Antonio. That's where they practice with their tanks, and they have uh, all new equipment out there. It's thousands of acres. It's a big place. But anyhow, these two men, as I was growing up, they would come over and see their mother, their sister, my grandmother, and... Uh, I had a great rapport with them. 
meant, meant that I really admired them. I was a boy uh, who uh, probably thought that I would have liked to have that share, living with Indians, this man uh, called Geronimo and these Apaches and the raids. Uh, the, you know, you have, you have your figment imagination, little boys, and you want to do such things as this. And to think that this, my great, their father was a federal marshal in San Antonio. That was something I used to think about too. Anyhow, that's, that's, that's just a little brief story. I would really advise you, they have this book here in the library. You would check it out, you could read it, you'd enjoy it. It looks very interesting. Uh, did they have troubles with language going both ways? Well, you know, I'll tell you the truth, they, they, uh, they picked up an Indian language very easy, being young boys. They picked it up easy. But uh, they had a kind of lot, you think they would, they would always have English, but they didn't. The youngest boy really had a tough time remembering English words. He would, he'd know words, but he couldn't, he couldn't form sentences. And um, he finally got back into it, you know, with riding with other ranchers and these Texas trail drivers going to Kansas and stuff like this. He began to pick it back up. And they they become civilized. They went back home and they, they recognized their mother and their fathers and their brothers and their sisters and things like this. How long did a trail drive take? You mentioned the Chisholm it, Trail. It, yeah, it took about uh, three months. Is it? You know, you're herding a bunch of cattle up there and you have to let them graze a bit. and You try to take them to a place where there's water, there's creeks and, and stuff like this where they drink. You let them drink for three or four days and you start the trail drive again. And... Um, there would be buyers in Kansas where there's no buyers in the rest of Texas. You had to take them where the buyers were. And they would bring them up, be great herds up there. Someday, if you, if you have interest in seeing these things, um, I live northwest of here, six miles out. I'd be glad to show you these collections. Mm -hmm.